Welcome to Video Podcast number 43. I'm going to get my, my little plug out the way from the beginning. Shine. Shine. My favorite flavor of vitamin water zero. Oh yeah, I got a, one of my listeners wrote me a comment in my comment section below. If you ever want to give me public feedback, do it in the comment section below. And I also have all my important and relevant links in the description section below. But one of my listeners, he said, I can't remember if he wrote me in the comment section. No, I take that back. I think he wrote me through Facebook. And he said, Alan, you know vitamin water zero leads to diabetes it's not true why you think I buy vitamin water zero zero means zero sugar you're talking about regular vitamin water the one that has grams of sugar in it can potentially lead to type 1 or type 2 diabetes which technically I already have anyway so that's what I'm fighting now I've had type 2 diabetes since um, November of 2015, almost two years. I've been diagnosed with type. But for those of you who know already, or I should say for those of you who don't know, unlike type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes is actually reversible. If you consistently eat right, drink the right beverages, and exercise regularly, you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, matter of fact, speaking of that, I haven't, I wouldn't say I've totally reversed it, but there was a medicine I was taking called metformin that I haven't taken in probably a month and a half, two months. Yeah, I, I don't even take my type 2 diabetes medicine anymore because number one, I don't really consume that much sugar and I'm going to tell you two things, a side effect, and some men who may be listening to me right now who suffer from type 2 diabetes, if you've ever taken a medicine, uh, metformin, you know it has at least two side effects, two side effects. One is related to what I, I got teased about in my last video podcast. Remember my very last video podcast, number 42? I open up my video without one of my classic hats on because normally I wear a hat. Well, one of the things that um, the medicine, type 2 diabetes medicine is called metformin. It causes your hair to start thinning out and to a certain degree falling out. Like I would take a shower and I would see like I ain't going to say large clumps, but I would see these like small clumps of my hair in the drain in the shower. And I'd be like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, so that's number one. <laughs> Here's the even bigger side effect that I, of course, share with my closest friends, and now I'm sharing it with the general public. Metformin fucks with your virility, man. Like, in a major way, like, like, Straight up, your dick will not get hard. Like, either one or two things. When you take metformin on a daily basis, either your dick will not get hard, or if it gets hard, it will go back to being soft in like a minute or two. And Alan Roger Curry can't function like that. So, yeah, all that to say, I'm like, fuck metformin. <laughs> <laughs> fuck me for me, man. I ain't no no can't fuck with the dick, man. Nope, 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 nope. Can't fuck, can't fuck with the dick. No, and my hair. So, no, that's why, brother. Because somebody else in my conversation said, Alan, you're starting to look leaner. You must be eating right and exercising right. You damn right, I am. Even if I didn't have type 2 diabetes, just because of my age, 54, 
I would make health and fitness. I mean, I always say it tell my male friends, man. Really, health and fitness should be something you emphasize throughout your whole life, period, in my opinion. Um, like when I was in my teenage years, 20s and 30s, I was always about health and fitness, man. I mean, always. I like, yeah, I rarely went more than like three or four months being out of shape. When I started getting a little lazy, it was probably starting with my 40s. Starting with the age of like 40, 41, 42. Yeah, I've allowed my, like, I give you a perfect example where you can see it. If you go on, on YouTube or Google, yeah, you, right here on YouTube. Look for my, those video clips from Berlin. From when I spoke in Berlin in, uh, I want to say it was April. Yeah, that was late April of 2013. A little over four years ago. I'm going to have to turn these notifications off, man. They be distracting me. Um, yeah, I'll tell you. No, I, well, technically, I can tell you two videos where I'm fat as fuck. <laughs> I won't even try to deny it. Um, they were both direct dating summit videos. When I was part of Sasha Day Games Direct Dating Summit weekend conferences for men, I was a participant in four of them. One in London in November 2010. One in Las Vegas in March of 2012. One in Berlin, Germany in late April of 2013. And one in Manhattan, New York in late July of 2013 and two of those four man I was heavy like for the one in Vegas I was probably I would estimate I was probably somewhere between 245 and 250 pounds so yeah, there's at least one video clip of me from the Las Vegas one. It's called Alan Roger Curry Talks About Phone Sex. And Yeah, um yeah, I was I was about somewhere between two forty five and two fifty. And in the one in Berlin, the Reg Dating Summit, there's one or two video clips here on YouTube. Yeah, I was probably between 240 and 245 when I was in Berlin. So I'm much slimmer than that now. Um, but yeah, that, that's when I started really getting lazy with my health and fitness was once I got into my 40s and, and to a certain extent my 50s. But yeah, since I since I came down with type 2 diabetes, I've been trying to take care of myself. Um, Wait, excuse me. So no, vitamin water zero does not lead to, to diabetes because it has no, there's no food or drink that doesn't have sugar in it that will directly lead to you coming down with that. The main culprit that leads to diabetes is sugar, anything with sh high sugar content. That's why I get mad at my fellow dating coach and friend, Steve and Dean Williams, talking about he's going to send me some lemon Oreo cookies. I'm like, you're trying, <laughs> you're trying to kill me. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to eliminate your dating coaching competition. Sending me some lemon Oreo cookies. Man, he sent me this stuff a couple years ago called Texas Trash. It's like these powdered sugar items like pretzels with powdered sugar and cookie bites with powdered Man, that, that, that's what, I tell Steve, that's what led to me getting type 2 diabetes. Um, okay, with Video Podcast 43, what I'm going to do is go back to my normal format. I'm going to give a free portion. I'm not going to try to predict how long my free portion. I try to keep my free portion 30 minutes or less, but honestly, this one might go longer. And then I'm going to have a portion specifically for my Patreon.com subscribers. 
Now, you know, I went up and went back down, and a couple people noticed it. If you go to my Patreon.com page, which is listed in the description section below, for the second month in a row, I went up and then went back down. And there's a reason for that. And I've alluded to it in a couple of previous video podcasts. See, there's some people on, uh, well, there's two, at least two, maybe three reasons. I've had some people write me and give me some valid excuses, so in their defense, I'll, I'll defend those guys. Here's the deal with Patreon, how you can be sneaky with Patreon that I don't like. And I booted people from my Patreon because they do this. I have different tiers of Patreon subscribers. Like I got the lowest is a $1 subscriber. Then there's a uh, next level up is a $5 subscriber. The next level up is a $10 subscriber. Then a $20. And then finally a $50. So what's that? One, five, ten, twenty five. So I got I got five different tiers for, for Patreon. Now most people I'd say probably 90, even maybe 95% of my Patreon.com subscribers, whatever they pledge, they keep that pledge, you know, indefinitely. But here's what some sneaky, shady people tried to do, starting with the month of July, and, and a few people did it this month, is they might pledge... $20, say, on August 3rd, August 4th, August 5th, which allows them to see a lot of just about all my videos if they pledge $20. And then on August 30th or August 31st, they'll edit that pledge down to $5. Because each, if you're familiar with Patreon, your Patreon... If you're a Patreon.com subscriber, your pledge doesn't get debited, taken out of your debit card or credit card until either the first or the second of the month. The first or the second of the month. So like, for example, this month, all my Patreon.com subscribers, their credit card or debit card get charged for their pledge on either September 1st or September 2nd. And so... What what these these sneaky types were trying to do is get twenty dollars worth of access, but only trying to pay five dollars for that access. And see, I'm 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 not tolerating that. So I booted people out. Now the the secondary reason is some people whose credit card or debit card it just declined because for insufficient funds. And I actually had, this month, I had at least four people that wrote me with genuine apologies. And they said that they just genuinely did not have the funds in their account. And they apologized and they said they were going to make, make up for it very soon. So I'm going to take them on their word. Um, but yeah, man. Yeah, like in the month of July, I had at least eight people that tried to do that sneaky shit where they, they initially pledged. $10 or $20 and then they edited it down to $1, $5 at the end of the month. No. You, you get booted if you try to do that shit. And I had at least yeah, I'd say about four or five people did that this month. So right now I think I'm at 94. I have 94 Patreon.com subscribers. I was up to on either August 30th or August 31st, I was actually up to as high as 103. I had as high as 103 Patreon.com subscribers, but for the reasons I just explained, it went back down. So, I want to always say I appreciate my Patreon.com subscribers, the ones, particularly the ones who are very loyal. Like, the one time, and I mentioned this once or twice before, I'll mention it again. There's one week, one seven day period where I do allow my Patreon.com subscribers uh, or what's otherwise known as my patrons 
to edit their pledge down without penalty or consequence. And that is between the third of the month and the ninth of the month, which is would be this week right here. So until Saturday, Saturday is the ninth. You can edit, if you're a Patreon up subscriber, if you're a patron of mine, say you have a $20 pledge and you want to edit it down to 10 or you got a $10 pledge and you want to edit it down to 5 or a $50 pledge and you want to edit it down to 20 or 10 You can do that without me criticizing you or penalizing you or booting you out between the 3rd of the month and the 9th of the month. The 3rd of the month and the ninth of the month, I allow that. That's the that's the one time you can edit your pledges down. You can edit your pledges up anytime, anytime. I welcome that. You can always edit your pledges up, but editing them down, you can only do that between the third and ninth of the month. Otherwise, I will boot you. I will boot you if you do it at any other moment. Um. What else to do with general housekeeping? Oh, I want to say, if I have any listeners or viewers that either were directly affected by Hurricane Harvey or they had friends, family members, and other acquaintances uh, that were profoundly affected by Hurricane Harvey, you, you have my sympathy. Um... That was a devastating hurricane. I mean, just absolutely just devastating. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have any like close friends or relatives that got affected by what happened um, in Texas with Hurricane Harvey, but the damage that that hurricane caused was just um, catastrophic. And so I genuinely feel for the people who lost their homes, uh, their businesses. I mean, I can't fathom how that would feel. I mean, you know, to just... <laughs> everything you work for, you know, if you had like a, a home that was built or something and you just you just lost it all your belongings and just you know it's just sad so and and here's is the you know there's a saying the hits just keep on coming and to throw salt on the wound I think most of you in the United States know there's another hurricane about to hit it's it's right right now it's it's a Category 5. That's the highest, most powerful category of a hurricane. There's another hurricane about to hit the southeastern border of the United States, as well as the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, Hurricane Irma. They said there's a chance it could divert and not hit, but right now, again, it, it got upgraded from a Category 4 to a Category 5. That's, that's a severe hurricane. So if it does stay on the path that it is right now, it's going to do some serious damage to states like Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and one or two other states, as well as, well as uh, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean islands. Um, so if I have listeners or viewers in Florida... Georgia, South Carolina, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean. Hey, be safe and take whatever precautions you need to take. Um, and matter of fact, speaking of that, that could, I'm waiting for a response from the, or, you know, as you know, I'm supposed, supposed to be a speaker at an event in Orlando, Florida in approximately three weeks. The 21 convention. That's scheduled to take place uh, September 28th through October 1st in Orlando, Florida. And so in three weeks. But if Hurricane Irma does serious damage to Orlando, 
which right now is right in the path of Hurricane Irma. I don't, I don't know what the status of that event is going to be. I mean, they might not allow flights to come into Orlando if there's catastrophic damage that's done to that city. So, you know, I just have to wait and see. And I'll keep you guys posted. Because uh, if I go to this event, I was planning on having at least a couple of uh, exclusive on-site videos for my Patreon.com subscribers. But, uh, yeah, I have to wait till what Anthony, he's the main organizer. I have to wait what he, he lets me know uh, as far as the, the, the status of that event in light of the impending hurricane. Irma. So anyway, everybody be safe. Um, I want to touch on a few things in this free portion. What am I at now? I'm at 22 minutes. I want to touch on a few things. First of all, my the portion for my Patreon.com subscribers is going to be related to an article that I have posted below. My most recent article for the Negro Manosphere that deals with um, slut shaming slut shaming and the Madonna Whore complex combination of the Madonna Whore Dr. Sigmund Freud's concept of the Madonna Whore complex and slut shaming I'm going to be talking about that because as you know if you if you read Who Say It Again or listen to the audiobook version of Who Say It Again I spent a whole chapter talking about pretty much these three things the Madonna whore complex men's sexual hypocrisy and slut shaming I actually talk about it in my original Mo one book if you remember chapter six I talk about how honestly I know a lot of guys do this and I know it's very prevalent in our society and so you can say I'm just a different cookie in the box but I don't I don't believe in slut shaming women. I don't Well, let me put an asterisk next to that. There are certain instances where I have. And I will go into more specific detail in my Patreon exclusive portion, but Yeah, there's certain instances when I do. And I have. But generally speaking, here's my thing, man. I'm not going to criticize a woman for exhibiting promiscuous behavior if I know I'm promiscuous. I'm not going to harshly criticize a woman for being polyamorous if I know I'm polyamorous. I mean, that's, that's, hypocr that's hypocrisy at its highest. Why the fuck would I want to do that? That, that, that? that to me makes no sense. And that's how I feel about all men. Now, if you're a man and you're genuinely monogamy oriented, and you happen to be criticizing women for being promiscuous, you have that right to do that. To me, that's when you have a valid right to criticize women for being promiscuous. If you're all about strict monogamy with women, but almost every woman you meet seems to have a promiscuous nature to them, and that frustrates you, then yeah, I don't have any criticisms of guys in that category. You have, you, you have a right to be critical. I'm only critical of guys who are promiscuous themselves, but yet they want to turn around and criticize women for being promiscuous. It's like, what the fuck? Oh, I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta address. So anyway, that's what I'm gonna talk about in my Patreon exclusive portion. Here's what I want to address in, uh, in my, uh, for the rest of the free portion, just a few things. A couple of them are, are minor and lighthearted. I'm trying, now, I would say, in my defense, for most of my videos, I think I remain pretty still. But there was probably one or two recent videos where I was rocking and moving, and a lot of people took notice. They were basically like, Alan, stay the fuck still, man. It's fucking with me, man. You keep moving on. You know who does that? I'm a teaser. I dare him to deny it. Steve D. Williams does that a lot, man. Steve D. Williams, it's almost hard for him to stay still when he does his video. 
On a lot of his videos, man, he's always moving, man. He's just like always moving. And I admit, sometimes that irritates me when I'm watching people and they just always move it. So I kind of actually empathize with the people who criticize me because it bothers me sometimes when I'm watching people and they just fucking move it. But yeah, I know there was one in particular, I can't remember which one it was. It was one of my last three or four videos where I was like rocking and swaying. Yeah, man, that, that irritated a lot of my, my, my listeners, viewers, supporters, followers. So, yeah, they were like, Alan, man, I say this in the nicest way, man. Stay the fuck still, man. So, I'm going to make every effort to keep my body relatively still um, during this video podcast. Second thing, now this, this, the second thing is something that I've probably been dealing with since high school. Um, and I know I used to get teased about this when I was on um, blog talk radio. I think most of us, men and women, have a few different variations of our voice. I don't know too many people that have the exact same voice 100% of the time. Like, a lot of times our voice is going to sound different if we're really excited about something or really frustrated about something or irritated about something or angry about something. So our voice tends to change. And I'm no exception. Like, I remember I had these women, these female bloggers that did some reviews of some episodes of my show, The Erotic Conversationalist, and they also did a review of at least two or three episodes of some of my upfront and straightforward episodes from, from Blog Talk Radio. And at least, I want to say at least two of them commented on my voice. They gave me a combination of a compliment and a criticism. Like I remember specifically one female blogger, she said, I like listening to Alan Roger Curry more on his show, The Erotic Conversations, because his voice is very even keel, is very calm and relaxed, and is very smooth and, and sexy and seductive. But she said, when you listen to him on his regular show, Up Front and Straightforward, on Blog Talk Radio, his voice is all over the place. It'll get real high-pitched. It'll get, what did she say, squilchy. It'll get real tense in the throat. And she said, I, I don't really like that. And just in the last seven to ten days, I want to say, I had quite a few people come, mainly women. I had maybe one or two guys, I think, comment on it. But I had a number of women write me about it. They were like, Alan, you had a recent video where we could tell, like, there's a thing that's known among speakers. Some people speak what's known as, like, I have this friend named Gina. She used to listen to all my blog talk radio shows, and she's really into, um, you know, vocals and speech patterns and whatnot. I want to say she used to work as a as a vocal coach. And I learned this from when I used to do, I used to be an actor. I don't know if a lot of you guys know. I used to do like stage theater. And one of the things I learned when I did stage theater is that there's a difference between speaking from your throat and speaking from your, what's known as your diaphragm. It's always much more recommended to speak from your diaphragm than to speak from your throat. The major difference is, has the, if there's w at least one central factor that separates the two, is your breathing. When you're speaking from the diaphragm, what that means is you're allowing yourself to still breathe as you're speaking. You're still breathing normally as you're speaking. When you speak from your throat, what you essentially do is if only a few seconds, you suspend 
you're breathing while you're talking. It's almost like, in a matter of speaking, you're holding your breath and then speaking and then you're releasing. And it, your voice tends to be more tense. It doesn't sound as resonant and it doesn't sound as relaxed and smooth when you speak from the throat. And so, yeah, some women, their criticisms were very lighthearted. Nobody, like, harshly attacked me. But, yeah, a lot of women, they were like, Alan, you don't sound the way you do on the erotic conversations. On the erotic conversations, you sound very sexy and seductive, and your voice is very much a turn-on. But on one of your recent video podcasts, you had this high-pitched, very tense-in-the-throat type voice that was just not pleasant to listen to. Excuse me. Oh, one other thing that adds to it, at least for me, I have what's known as chronic sinus problems. So my nose gets stuffed up a lot. And I, matter of fact, I have what's known as sinusitis, I think it's called. And uh, my nose gets stuffed up a lot. <laughs> when I was young, my brother he used to have a nickname I hated. He used to call me Snorky. <laughs> he used to call me Snorky because I had all these nose problems. He said, man, you got to, no one even said I had a big nose. And number two, he said, man, you always got like some kind of nose problems, man. I'm just call you Snorky. Gotta love your siblings, excuse me. Now, that was a more lighthearted criticism related to my voice. Now, here was a more serious, more insulting tone criticism of my voice. Now, you know what I'm going to have to reference. I don't really want to, but I'm going to reference it. If you look at my recent videos, you'll see that I uploaded a video called YouTube Host Apologizes to Dating Coach Alan Roger Curry. Now, I'm still not going to say this YouTube host name, but if you listen to that video, obviously, he says his own name in the video. This is the guy who I've been having the infamous back and forth with, or some would call it a beef with. Burp number one. So yeah, and I the reason I uploaded that is that I wanted to point out that this guy, before we fell out, he used to sing my praises like for about 18 to 24 months. He used to do nothing but sing my praises and promote my books and endorse them. And recommend them to his listeners and followers. And then, as you know, in the, during the first week of June is when we had our parting of ways. Now, initially, I want to reiterate, even though I would say without question it's become more personal now, initially when I parted ways with this, this young brother, it wasn't really a personal thing. It was more of a, it was a strictly business decision. It was strictly on a business level, business level. And during our email exchange, when I let this brother know that I didn't want to do any, not that I was officially doing any business with him, because actually I wasn't, it's just that he had proposed some future business collaborations with me and I, I let him know that I wasn't going to enter into any type of business collaborations with him in the near or distant future. Now during our email exchange he specifically made the comment he because I asked him to refrain from mentioning my name and more importantly to refrain from endorsing, promoting, and recommending my, my books anymore. And at the time, this was on June 6th of this year, he specifically said in his email, I still have an email, he said, you have my word on it. I won't. Let me repeat that. He said, 
I will no longer mention your name, your brand, or your books. You have my word on it. But then, literally, I want to say less than 24 hours later, he went back to mentioning my name and talking about my books. He took a jab at Mo One. He took a jab at Ooh Said Again. I want to say, yeah, I don't think he's ever, and I've mentioned this, I think, in a couple of previous podcasts. This brother who's this YouTube podcast, he's never, ever, to, at least to my recollection, he's never criticized the possibility of sex, and he's never criticized the beta male revolution. Matter of fact, not only would I say he's never criticized those two books, he liberally borrows talking points from both of those books. And I just recently went into his comment section and called him out on a bad habit he has because what he does is not only does he borrow a boatload of talking points from both of those books, but a lot of times he doesn't proper, properly attribute credit to me for those talking points. In other words, he'll almost present those talking points as if they're his own talking points. When the reality is he's lifting talking points directly from my two fucking books which is the like he did it in a recent podcast of his he lifted a lot of talking points from the beta male revolution right off the top of my head chapter two when i talk about how that period between 1960 and 1974 dramatically changed male female relationships in this country and the dating rituals between men and women in this country he lifted a lot of talking points from chapter two of Beta Male Revolution, but yet he didn't give me any proper attribution. So on those two books, he never criticizes those two books. I, I can't think of a time when he's done a podcast where he criticized either the possibility of sex or he criticized the Beta Male Revolution. Because again, he loves to borrow talking points from those books. So it would almost make him look stupid to criticize those two books. But he, he has taken jabs at both Mo One and Ooh Say It Again. Now, anyway, I'm going to bring it back to the issue of my voice. I was doing what's known as a YouTube hangout, they call them, with uh, my good friend O'Shea Duke Jackson, who's the editor-in-chief of the Negro Manosphere, the website I write for. And Steve D. Williams was part of this hangout. Uh, Valdez, a.k.a. Angry Man, who I call my little bruh, he was part of the hangout. I think that's it. Yeah, it was. It was so it was, it was, initially it was just us four. Me, O'Shea, Steve D. Williams, and Angry Man. And then this guy, who I've had the back and forth slash beef with, he happened to come into the chat room what's known as the super chat those are nice by the way he can make a lot of money on those super chats I don't I, I still I need to upgrade my equipment so I can do live streams that's still something I want to do in the future but right now I just haven't upgraded my equipment to do that as of yet but um so making a long story short O'Shea who was leading the who was hosting the hangout he invited this brother to call in to the hangout so he could respond to a lot of questions we had for him. And I surely had a lot of questions for this brother. Most notably, the fact that he went back on his word. Again, he told me, he gave me his word that he wasn't going to mention my name or brand or my books. Then he turned around and did it. Now his response was, no, O'Shea asked me, he said, Let's call him the old man. I've used that nickname before in one of my previous podcasts, so that's the nickname I'll give him without saying his full name. He said, old man, wouldn't you say you just flat out lied to Alan Roger Curry because you gave him your word that you weren't going to mention his name or his books anymore, but you continue to do so? And his response was, I changed my mind. That was his response. He said, I changed my mind. And O'Shea was like, that's lying. <laughs> you gave me a word. 
So in other words, you lied. And he said, no, I, I respectfully disagree. I changed my mind. First of all, before I get to the point related to my voice, I'm right in the center of this as far as whether his statement could be considered a true or valid statement. Half of me would agree with O'Shea that he lied. He flat out lied. And now he's trying to deny it, but he lied. Now, in this guy, old man's partial defense, he at least partially you could say he's not lying because technically, technically there's a difference between lying and reneging. There's a, most of you, with the exception maybe some of you young people, most of you are familiar with the term reneging. There's, there's, a, there's a phrase like he reneged on his promise or she reneged on her guarantee. So reneging, you could say, is very similar to lying. I would almost figuratively say it's a first cousin to lying. But some people would argue it's not exactly the same as lying. Because lying usually has to do with something you already did or something you already said. Like if I already ate some cookies out of my mother's cookie jar and she asked me, Alan, did you eat those last three cookies out of cookie jar? I say, no, mama, no, I didn't eat those cookies. And then later on, it's found out that I did eat those cookies. Then that means I lied. See, I, I said I didn't do something when I actually did, meaning past tense. So technically, most lying usually, usually has to do with something that already took place. Whereas when you're talking about not honoring your word for something that's going to happen in the future, that more so falls under the category of reneging. Reneging. So if I promise, let's say I had a client named Joe, and I said, Joe, if you buy five one hour Skype consultations from me, I will give you two more one hour Skype consultations for free. So basically, if you buy five, I'll give you seven. And he says, okay. And then say he buys five Skype consultations, but because money becomes tight with me, or I, I feel like I need to earn more money, I say, you know what I'm saying about Joe now? I can't give you those two free Skype consultations. You got to pay for those two. And he's like, what? That's fucked up, Alan. Man, you told me if I bought five, I'd get seven. And I said, nah, well, I changed my mind. Now, can Joe say I lied to him? Generally speaking, yes, he could. He could say I lied to him. I told him that if he bought five consultations, I would give him seven. And then later on, I tell him, no, I changed my mind. I'm only going to give you five, the five that you paid for. So in one sense, you could say I lied to him, but more technically, what I did was I reneged on an offer is what I really did. That's called reneging on an offer. I reneged on my offer. I put an offer forth and then I took it back. So yeah, technically that's what's called reneging. Here's the bottom line. Whether you categorize it as lying or reneging, the end result is still, it shows the people that you're dealing with that your word doesn't mean shit. And there's a lot of old school people who believe, like people my, definitely in my father and grandfather's generation, they, they used to believe that your word was your bond, man. Like once you lose, once your word loses credibility, you've lost credibility. That's an old like phrase, your word is your bond. Like there was a lot of businessmen, like see nowadays most true businessmen they they use contracts, written contracts. Like I know I'm like that. 
95 to 99 percent of the time I do business with people, I have a written contract. That's why most businesses have written contracts, so you can't renege. You can't renege when you have written contracts, otherwise people can take you to court and sue your ass. You know, I had a situation with another dating coach. I'm not going to say his name. But I, I had a minor situation with another dating coach tried to do that with me. It involved some video footage. He was trying to make money off of some video footage that included me, but he wasn't trying to pay me the, the proper percentage. Uh, he was like, let's say he was going to give me 10% of the profits from the videos when in my contract, I specified a higher percentage than that because I'm real protective over over my footage when I like do speaking engagements like I'm not gonna allow somebody to use video footage of me make money off of my video footage and you only paying me a little bit amount of money hell no are you kidding if you're gonna use video footage of me that includes me and you making money off it, you, you best guarantee I'm going to get paid. <laughs> Believe that shit, but that's another subject for another day. Um, but yeah, the bottom line is whether you lie, what you did was considered lying or reneging on a promise. Either way, it means your words don't have credibility, which means the average person who would be potentially looking to do business with you can't trust your word. Why would anybody want to do business with somebody who's, who's, who's likely to renege on them? Again, if you got contracts, they wouldn't be able to do that anyway. I don't, I don't, I don't associate people whose, whose words don't mean shit. If your words don't mean shit. But anyway, I'm not going to get into all the details of this particular hangout. You can go over to O'Shea Duke Jackson's, uh, YouTube channel and listen to yourself. But, Here's what this guy did. I, I I just gotta I gotta I gotta take some jabs at him on this. A lot of strong hardball questions that were thrown his way. He either respectfully declined to answer the questions, or he would quickly deflect the question and and immediately change to some other issue, some some other subject. Something that this person criticizes women for doing. <laughs> I find that very funny. Because this, this same YouTube host, one of his criticisms against women is that if you talk to women about ABC, they'll want to talk about DEF or CDE instead of ABC. And I agree with him actually on that. So I'm going to take a jab at, at the female gender. A lot of you women are guilty of that. I know in my own history of dealing with women, a lot of women are guilty of doing that. And when it comes to debates or discussions about certain issues, you'll present ABC and they'll want to talk about DEF or they'll want to talk about CDE or they'll want to talk about uh, BCD. So women have a bad habit of doing that. So in that, in that, in that, in regard to that criticism of women, I agree with that. But on this hangout, this very host, the thing he criticizes women for doing, he did the very thing. And if you don't believe me, you can go and listen to the hangout yourself and form your own opinion. He did the same thing. Now, I'm a, now I'm going to come to my final point to do with this whole issue, and then I'll drop this issue. And more than likely, this will conclude my free portion. When he did a lot of his deflecting, in a lot of his respectful declines to answer certain questions. His voice was very cool, calm, collected. Whereas I was very animated. And a lot of his loyal fans, followers, you know, financial supporters, they came into O'Shea's comment section of the video and over at, his, at the old man's comment section and said, oh man, Alan was very emotional. Man, oh man, I think you won that discussion because you got Alan Roger Curry to get emotional. There were a lot of times when he was asking questions where he sounded extremely emotional.
you know me you know by now you know me and my looks so what what fucking look am I giving you right now so for those of you who do not know how to properly assess and evaluate the manner in which the person uses their voice let me break it down for you in simple terms there's a difference between being emotional and being animated or verbally emphatic those are two totally different things two totally different things I give an example if you watch the NBA I'm a big NBA fan if you watch the NBA and listen to the play-by-play -play announcers like guys like Marv Albert or Kevin Harlan or Mike Breen all those guys are very animated when they're doing a the game when they're calling the game and when certain players make certain plays they're very verbally emphatic most politicians, when they're on the presidential trail and they're campaigning for votes, when they speak to their, their, their followers, they'll be very animated and they'll be very verbally emphatic. A lot of attorneys, when they're in litigation, doing a court case, i I give you a classic example. If you go back to the O.J. Simpson case, if you remember this most controversial figure, a lot of people said this one turned the case in favor of O.J. Simpson being ruled not guilty. Is Mark Furman, the, the, the racist police officer. When they were grilling Mark Furman on the witness stand, he was very cool, calm, and collected when he said, I would like to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. So if you if you giving out points for just being cool, calm, and collected, you would have to give Mark Furman points. He wasn't, you know, bent out of shape. He was very calmly like, I would like to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Whereas the attorneys who were asking the questions, I would say to one degree or another, they were kind of animated. Johnny Cochran, the, the main attorney, he was extremely animated and, ver and verbally emphatic particularly in his closing arguments of that case. Does that mean he was emotional? First of all, a lot of men tend to attach negative connotations to the notion of a man being emotional. Like basically that's representative of you being feminine or wimpy or uh, a beta male or whatever that's not true you so you, you you telling me that Michael Jordan is is, is is a pussy is a feminine type dude because he cried when he won his first NBA championship is that what you're telling me you telling me he's like a that Michael Jordan you saying he's a bitch because he showed emotion you saying LeBron James is a bitch because he showed emotion when he won that championship for Cleveland. If you watch any top athlete, they should demonstrate emotions both during the game, after the game, and sometimes even before the game. So if anyone was to say that it's unmanly for a man to show emotions, then I would like to see you present that to a lot of these top-notch athletes directly to their face and see what response you're going to get. Shoot, almost every top athlete I know is extremely emotional. Steph Curry is emotional when he makes certain plays on the court. Draymond Green for the Golden State Warriors is very emotional. Michael Jordan, as I mentioned, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was hella emotional. Hella emotional. I know when I'm competing. I don't do it so much now that I'm older, but like when I used to play just hoops on the playground with, with friends and acquaintances, man, shoot, man, <laughs> shoot, I, I 
I've mentioned that I think in one of my previous video podcasts. I used to be real emotional against my own friends. Like sometimes I would ready to be I would ready be ready to start a fight with some of my like closest friends on the basketball court. Like if I felt like they fouled me too hard or something, dude, I'd be ready to fight. I'm talking about with dudes I was like this way. Because my competitive nature would come out, man. So that's number one, man. Ain't nothing wrong with a man being emotion, emotional. Here's when emotions are a negative thing. Not only for men, but for women. Here's the only time, really, when emotions are a negative thing. Anytime you allow your to become so overwhelmed with emotions to the point where you begin to deviate deviate from rational logical objective minded intelligent thinking that's when you're allowing your emotions to have a detrimental effect on you let me repeat that. The number one time when emotions are to your detriment is when you are allowing your mo emotions to cause you to deviate, significantly deviate from you thinking in a rational manner, in a logical manner, in an objective-minded manner, and in a generally intelligent manner. That is when your emotions are getting the best of you. Basically, when it when your emotions are causing you to become irrational, to think in an illogical or irrational manner. That's when your emotions are getting the worst of you. But See, again, as it relates to both audio podcasts and video podcasts, a lot of times people, and I would say more so men than women, but women are probably guilty of this too, but a lot of men think if you simply raise your voice, become more animated, and raise the volume of your voice and become what I call more verbally emphatic, that that's synonymous with becoming emotional. But again, referencing this 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 uh, YouTube hangout I did with O'Shea Duke Jackson and the other fellas. There was no point during that hangout where I was asking questions in an irrational manner. Where my way of thinking, my way of thinking had become irrational or illogical. The reason why I raised my voice and I was so verbally emphatic is it, to put it in real simple terms, I think this person, who I refer to as the old man, I just think he's just totally full of shit, man. <laughs> Period. It, it really ain't no other longer explanation than that. And I'm like that with all people who I think are full of shit. Male, female, old, young, black, white, whatever. I, I, You can say I have a low tolerance for people who are full of shit. What do I... What was that flash that you? I just saw a flash. What do I consider full of shit? Most people, I think, have the same general. Full of shit to me is a person who has one or more of these general qualities. When you regularly or semi-regularly exhibit behavior that is dishonest, disingenuous, highly manipulative, inconsistent, contradictory, and/or hypocritical, a mix of those qualities I just mentioned. Dishonest disingenuous, manipulative, inconsistent, contradicting, hypocritical. That means you, you, you're, you're full of shit, man. That means you're a full of shit person. And so that's at least 50% of the reason why my voice was getting... Because I, I just think this person is full of shit, man. He, he is. He does a lot of shit that he doesn't own up to. Period. He does a lot of shit that he doesn't own up to. My final comment on him would be, he criticizes, most of his YouTube podcasts have to do with criticizing 
women, and particularly black women, on their fuckery. And a lot of his criticisms are valid. I don't, I don't disagree with a hundred percent of his criticisms towards a lot of women, even a lot of black women. But one of the reasons why we were talking to him and asking him a lot of questions we did during the Google Hangout is that we wanted him to realize that when it comes to him interacting with other men, he's full of a lot of fuckery. See, and that, that's what he wasn't willing to own up to or acknowledge. He's full of a lot of fuckery when it comes to his dealings with other men. So you can say the same way he's irritated by the fuckery of women, that's how me, O'Shea, Stevie D. Williams, and Angry Man look at him. <laughs> we look at him the same way he looks at black women. He's, he's just a shit starter. He's, he, he causes a lot of drama. And my more specific issue with him to date, the reason why I even like bother to keep mentioning his name or talking about him instead of, and I explain this I think in my video called Feedback from Video Podcast 35 and 36 when I did that parody of him in the last hour of the video. Here's my single biggest issue with him right now, and, and this is why I even went over to his comments section and told him. The dude liberally will borrow a lot of talking points from my books. No, no, not only my books. He'll borrow talking points from two of my books, The Possibility of Sex and The Beta Male Revolution, and he'll borrow talking points from my old archived episodes of Upfront, Upfront and Straightforward on Blog Talk Radio. Now, in his partial defense, before I've fallen out, I would say most of the time, not all the time, most of the time he would give me proper credit. Like if he used a talking point of mine, he would say, you know, Alan Roger Curry said this in the Beta Male Revolution. Alan Roger Curry said that in the Possibility of Sex. Alan Roger Curry mentioned this on an old episode of his on Blog Talk Radio. But since we've fallen out, he rarely if ever does that. He'll borrow my talking points and present them as if they are his. Again, he did this just two days ago. So that, that's the only reason I keep talking about it. And I'm going to continue to call him out. I'm not going to remain silent about that shit. Like some people say, oh, Alan, why don't you just ignore him? Or why don't you remain silent? Why don't you just never bring him up? No. If somebody's borrowing my talking points like that, particularly from my books. Now, my radio shows, eh, I only care about that on a minor degree because that's technically not necessarily copyrighted material. But stuff in my books, man, that's copyrighted material, man. You can't, you can't get into the range of infringing on someone's copyright like that. I can't say to this point he's just blatantly been guilty of copyright infringement. Otherwise, I would have flagged one or more of his videos already if he had. But you could say he's become, he's coming dangerously close to doing that on some of his videos. He, he, you know, you, again, you, you can't borrow the talking points in other people's books and not give them credit. That, that's borderline copyright infringement, man. You can't present, he can't present my talking points as if they're his talking points. So. On that note, I'm in this. Well, you know what? Instead of continuing this video, here's what I'm going to do for my Patreon subscribers. Either later on today or early tomorrow, I'm going to give you a whole separate one that won't have a free portion. I think I did that last week or the week before last. I did that. Remember? Yeah, I did that twice two weeks ago. Instead of doing the, a video that has both a free portion and a Patreon portion, what I did was simply do one video for the general public, and I did a whole separate video for my Patreon subscribers. So either later on today, or sometime tomorrow, what's tomorrow, Wednesday? Wednesday, I am going to do, 
my Patreon exclusive video is going to center around basically a lot of stuff I talked about in my Negro Manistry area. The Madonna Horror Complex, men's sexual hypocrisy, and slut shaming. Those three things. I'm going to either make it for my $5 subscribers or my $10 subscribers. I haven't decided yet. But it's going to cover those three things. That's what I'm going to do either later on today or tomorrow. So, but I will wrap up this video. So, hopefully, ladies, my voice didn't escalate too much, but that's just Alan Roger Curry, you know. Now, when I'm talking to a woman, and of course, I'm in the midst of getting her pussy wet, then my voice just naturally drops in its volume, and it naturally becomes more smooth and seductive. You ladies know that who've dealt with me in real life. Or at least over the phone. So you know my, my voice does not vacillate when I'm in what I call seduction mode. My voice is always low volume, smooth, and seductive. But when I'm talking about just general shit, yeah, my voice is all over the place. My voice will go very, very high. Again, sometimes I'll have that tense talking from the throat type deal. That's just who Alan Roger Curry is. But to recap again, there's a difference between being emotional in your verbal delivery of a question or comment and being animated and or verbally emphatic. But two recaps. One, there's nothing wrong with a man being emotional. Most of your top-notch actors male actors in Hollywood. The reason why they're successful is because they know how to interject their emotions in their performances like Al Pacino, Denzel Washington. Most of your top-notch athletes are very emotional. Kobe Bryant was hella emotional. Michael Jordan was emotional. Steph Curry's emotional. LeBron's emotional. Serena Williams, when she plays tennis, she's, she's very emotional. Well, she's a woman, so she don't count. I was talking about men. But, yeah, there's a lot of male, male athletes, uh, football players who's in the football world. I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, what's the wide receiver for uh, Des Bryant? Des Bryant is, is hella emotional. <laughs> Tom Brady, he always pumping out his fist with emotion. Ray Lewis was very emotional when he played for the Baltimore Ravens. Ain't nothing wrong with a man being emotional. The only time emotions, again, are a bad thing for both a man or a woman is when you allow your emotions to deviate from logical, rational, objective-minded, and generally intelligent. Oh, I'm going to give you a personal story that I'm going to wrap up on. And only a, I think only a few of you noticed what I did announce it publicly I think on my birthday but before that only my brother and my closest closest friends knew this but um, I don't, I, I'm, 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 speaking of emotions see I'm going to try to talk about this without getting emotional I might get emotional talking about this but um, last summer I could have potentially died in a fire Yeah. Yep. I could have potentially died in the fire. And um, I was put in a position where I basically had to save my own life. The fire people were, were not at the location yet, and, and I had to save my own life. And. Um, When I realized what situation I was in, I wasn't so much in danger of being engulfed by flames. I don't think there was ever a moment during that situation where I was genuinely in, 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 in imminent danger of being engulfed by flames. 
But there was definitely a point where I was in imminent danger of being a victim of smoke inhalation. And um, there was a few seconds where my panic emotions took over. There was at least probably, I would say, a good minute, minute and a half, two minutes, where to my detriment, I began to panic. I, I, I genuinely, and I, I don't say this lightheartedly, I thought it was... I, <laughs> I thought it was that moment. Yeah. I thought God was calling me home. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't I don't replay. that I don't replay that in my head. But I quickly gained my composure because I knew that in order to save my life, I had to think rationally. I had to say to myself, Alan Roger Curry, don't panic. What are you going to do here? What's your plan of action? to save your life. And I gathered up my most important things that I could put in like just this little backpack I got. And I went in the bathroom and I wet a big towel. I just soaked it in water. And I knew when I left this apartment that I was going to have to hold my breath for a minimum of a good two, three minutes, if not slightly longer. Because outside of my apartment was nothing but smoke. Nothing but smoke. And I did. I wrapped my head in this towel. And I took a real deep breath. And I exited the apartment. And I had to feel my way with my eyes closed. I had to feel my way for the uh, the exit door. Anyway, long story short, yeah. I was one of only like two or three people in the apartment building that managed to save their own life. Because again, the, the fire personnel hadn't, hadn't, hadn't arrived yet. So... That night was like 1.32 in the morning. My emotions could have been my downfall. If I had stayed in that, that panic moment mode I was in for that two-minute span, I would have just emotionally crumbled. But I didn't. I knew I had to man up. It wasn't an option. <laughs> You know, there's been movie. What's that movie line where somebody says, "This is not an option, motherfucker." It wasn't an option for me to man up. It was basically either I was gonna have to man up, or I was gonna potentially die of smoke inhalation. So even once I gained my composure, I was still emotional. Because I've, I've never been in a fire before. That was the first and only time I've ever been involved in a fire. Ever. In my entire life. But I did not allow myself to deviate from coming up with a plan of action to save my life. That's the only reason. I'm here talking to you today. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, 
you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yes. 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 Oh. 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 You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How seductive your intonations are, the vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice. How you could make her pussy so wet just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king.